Welcome to the House Minority Press Availability. I'm House Minority Leader Representative Chris Tuck, and with me, I have uh, Representative Dan Ortez from Ketchikan, our Independent in the in the uh, Caucus, and then Representative uh, Sam Quito, uh, representing here in Juneau. Visiting this week, we have parents, teachers, and administrators as part of the school district legislative fly-in. Um, uh, we have uh, school board members from all over the state visiting, and from also from all over the state, we have the Alaska Home Builders Association. And later this week, we uh, expect to see Planned Parenthood arriving. Uh, also this week, we have the State of the Judiciary Address, which will be given by uh, Chief Justice Dana Fabe uh, Wednesday at 11 o'clock. It's a joint session between the House and the Senate. And don't forget to file your permanent fund dividend and be sure to pick, click, and give for those organizations that are important for you. And uh, the nominations for the First Ladies Volunteer of the Year Award close March 2nd. Please forward your names, uh, uh, your recommendations going forward. And um, uh, today at noon, I'll be speaking with Representative uh, Christ Tompkins at the Native Issues Forum. As many of you have noticed, uh, our 13 member caucus has rebranded ourselves the Alaska Independent Democratic Coalition. Uh, we are no longer the um, just Democrats in this caucus. Uh, with Representative Dan Ortez joining us uh, from Ketchikan, our independent, we are made up of independents and, and uh, Democrats. Much the same way that we have uh, Governor Walker being independent and uh, Lieutenant Governor being a Democrat, and those two working side by side, um, having their offices side by side with one another. Uh, we're a non-binding caucus. Uh, we um, vote our conscience. Uh, and so that truly makes us independent. So that name reflects not only who we are, but what we're about. And uh, we want to make sure with that new Walker Milan administration that uh, we carry that spirit of unity into the legislature. So we're independent, we're free thinking lawmakers, and uh, we want to work together to make uh, Alaska where we're protecting public education, we have uh, uh, our communities are, are safe and access to affordable health care and creating opportunities for all Alaskans. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Representative Ortez. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'd just like to express my appreciation for the opportunity to be a part of this uh, independent democratic coalition. It allows me uh, to be able to be uh, the kind of legislator that I, you know, that I want to be, to be able to vote my conscience, to be able to promote uh, nonpartisanship, to be able to promote uh, the idea that, hey, as legislators, all of us are here to try to serve the best interests of Alaskans overall, and irrespective of any kind of political party. This is not about um, Democrats or Republicans or independents. It's about uh, serving the best needs of Alaskans overall. We're in a tough situation with this uh, with this budget crisis of $3.5 billion <laughs> deficit, and it's going to require um, everybody coming together, working together uh, to try to solve uh, this situation and to try to put us on a sustainable budget. And um, uh, to me, uh, the best way to do that is in a nonpartisan fashion. And so that's why I'm excited about the opportunity to be a part of the coalition and uh, uh, to be a part of this uh, Alaska legislative uh, session. So thank you very much. And Representative Quito. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Dan. And Dan brought up the, one of the key things that everybody's talking about now, and that's our $3.5 billion budget deficit. It's going to be a really big issue to be discussed this year. So one of the things that I think is important to emphasize really is we're not going to completely cut our way to a balanced budget. And we've got a few years of savings. We have to carefully use that savings so we can extend it as long as possible. But when we're looking at a $3.5 billion deficit, we're only generating revenues of $2.8 billion. We've got a big fiscal issue that we've got to look at. So my role on the education, transportation, and uh, commerce subcommittees uh, is an important one. We're looking at a lot of different issues within those three departments, and other members of our caucus are looking into other departments. We're trying to work with the governor's budget. We just received information from the governor last week on on his new budget. Uh, we're waiting for the ledge finance reviews of that information so we can actually dig deeper into um, what those cuts actually mean for Alaska. A uh, few of the key things that we're looking at are education as a priority, public safety, 
health care, maintaining our essential infrastructure. Um, education is a priority. The governor proposed a 2.5% cut to the general fund uh, budget, and we do have some concerns about that. It's a challenge um, that, that he's accepted moving forward, but we would really like to try and see if there's a way we can preserve that one-time funding that was committed last year. Even with that one-time funding, school districts are looking at a decrease in, in, uh, in teachers and increase in parent or pupil-to-teacher ratio. So one other issue that's going to be important, I think, this year is looking at revenue sharing. We're seeing pressure on revenue sharing, but it really is critically important for the state of Alaska to provide support for small communities. So that support for small communities goes into municipal municipalities through revenue sharing, but also allows those municipalities to partner efficiently with tribal governments to bring services to small communities. So those, that's something that, that we're going to be looking at very carefully. Um, and another thing that was uh, rolled out last year, last week by the governor is uh, his proposal for Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion actually does a lot. It adds coverage for around 40,000 new people in the state of Alaska. Um, those 40,000 new people and the coverage brings more commerce into the state, more health care services, and actually will save the state money. We're looking at the, a, a, a statement that we're saving six million dollars in the first year. Four million of that is for inmates that are covered in prisons that we are paying general fund for right now when they go out to try and get health care. Um, that savings actually stays beyond 2020 when the state has to start paying 10 percent. There's an anticipation of actually a savings of three million dollars general fund after that point. So all of those things are really important making sure that we take care of the infrastructure we have, water and sewer systems, road systems, uh, that we have the ability to provide the essential services to um, the most of the Alaskans as possible. So with that I think uh, we're about ready to open it up for questions. Yeah, and please state your name and affiliation. Shauna Crondall, Alaska Education Update. Um, sorry, Shauna Crondall, Alaska Education Update. Um, my question is probably for Representative Keto because I know you were at the AASB um, Q&A yesterday. I don't know if any, anyone else watched it, but um, Pete Hefner from Cordova, which is a really small school district, said they it cost them $30,000 to implement the um, restraint and seclusion uh, bill last year. And so I'm guessing for Anchorage, it was probably millions of dollars. Um, what responsibility does the legislature have to look at how much these things are going to cost the legislature that these this legislation that has zero fiscal note that supposedly has zero fiscal impact? Thank you, Shauna. That's a really important question, and it's something with the school district meetings I've had that we're hearing about, that we do pass laws, and those laws may have unintended impacts. Some of these laws, the districts are really wanting to enforce, that are really wanting to, to uh, um, have those, those rules in place, but there's not funding associated with that. And it's an a important issue. One of the things that's a challenge is really when we pass a law, it is difficult for us to reach out and anticipate what that impact might be for a school district. Um, as an, an engineer, I might be able to provide some idea, but I would not be able to put a number to how much something might cost. Really, we're going to work with the school districts to make sure that they, if they anticipate costs, can let us as a legislature know. But then we do a follow-up, I guess, so the, the seclusion and restraint. If there are issues like that that we now know are going to be costing money, making sure that that money is either provided or that we look at other areas where we're asking schools to do things that maybe they don't need to do now, maybe things that were important 20 year, or 25 years ago that don't need to be done now, and those can be removed as a, a, a mandate to the school districts, could provide a savings, and then could still keep money in the classroom. I think it's going to be important discussion for a lot of the legislatures, legislators as uh, the school districts work their way around the building. And we're asking for them to provide, provide us with a specific list of items and what for their districts are the costs, because those costs will vary by district. So uh, ha having an idea of what that impact might be will be useful for us as we try and move forward. And Representative Tess. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Being that I come from a, uh, the education background, I worked 32 years as a public school teacher, I saw up close uh, and personal what the impact of some of these unfunded mandates uh, meant to us on a, on a regular basis. And I've certainly heard over this past uh, week from school districts that are uh, visiting about this particular issue, uh, how sometimes we, we pass these well-intended uh, mandates without the funding to back them up, and, and it has a real impact on, on, on the uh, budgets of, of the individual districts. So 
Um, just yesterday, I asked the governor about that issue, and and um, you know he he agreed that that was an area that we needed to look at uh, in terms of. Uh, you know what these specific impacts are so I'm encouraged by that and I think it's you know it's essential that w that we do that especially if we're looking at times of uh, cutting back to school districts and funding we better also uh, look for opportunities for them to to be able to uh, make up some of that with with savings and perhaps uh, take a good long look at some of these mandates and, and maybe step away from some of them and say hey uh, while it might have been good intention, uh, perhaps it's it's uh, not in the best interest now at this time. So, I just wanted to add that. Um, Pat. Uh, yeah. uh, Pat for VA Alaska. This question is: uh, the, It appears that the administration has ended the film credit program and uh, is proposing to do that in the future as well, take it out of the budget. Um, you support that? Uh, last year, I think you were the House co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, Two years ago. What, what do you think of that action? Can we no longer afford that program? Yeah, well, all as a as we're facing the deficits that we're facing now, <clears throat> all tax credits are going to be looked at. And uh, I understand, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, three of the positions have been eliminated from that office. Uh, it still falls in you need the Department of Revenue. Uh, my understanding is Department of Revenue will try to still keep that active currently. Um, they may not be taking any new applications at this time, um, but uh, it's not being eliminated, it's just being put on hold. And with three p positions leaving, uh, maybe the Department of Revenue might be able to uh, find some efficiencies and be able to do it in-house, but it, it sounds like at this point that uh, it's on hold. But one of the things I want to point out is that you know, we spend $12 million a year marketing tourism in Alaska. This might be another opportunity, rather than, than making that direct investment, that we can indirectly impact tourism in Alaska by allowing motion pictures to be filmed right here in Alaska, showing our beauty, showing the people, and creating a, a, a desire for people to come up and see who we're about and to uh, experience Alaska. So uh, uh, one of the things that the tax credit has, has done for this is exposed Alaska to the rest of the world, and we hope that continues. Uh, how do you think about the way the governor? How do you think about the way the governor did it? Um, can the administration just ignore a law that's on the books now and say they're not going to enforce it? Um, well, uh, I think with the uh, the situation that we're in right now, eliminating three positions. I mean, there's going to be positions eliminate being eliminated across the state through many different programs. Uh, and then when you look at uh, f putting a freeze right now, I think it's just it's a prudent thing to do until we can get uh, our hands and grasp about the situation that we're in and then know what direction that we should go. So one of the nice things about uh, uh, the situation that we're in, I mean, we've got to look at it as positive as possible, is we get a chance to reset ourselves and uh, refocus our priorities. So it's not that it's, it's eliminated, it's just that it's put on hold at this point. Yes, Katie. Hi, Katie Lawrence with The Empire. Um, the ABC board is meeting this week to talk about marijuana uh, regulations, maybe for the first time officially. Um, <coughs> I was wondering if each of you could talk about the new law as it applies to your district and what you hope to see um, come out of everything. Like to start? Sure. Um, serving in community regional affairs, we've been hearing uh, some testimony about the um, uh, the initiative and and uh, and about how that might Im impact individual communities, et cetera. I think for me, um, it's paramount that that as we try to set some of these regulations in place, uh, that that we're number one listening to the communities, that we're uh, getting their input, that we're uh, letting it be as much as possible. Um, a locally controlled uh, issue with with autonomy uh, for those communities as much as, as, as we can the initiative itself uh, called for that allowed for that and so um, I guess my priority would be that uh, that uh, we as much as possible provide for the end result provides for an, that autonomy in those local communities and those local boroughs uh, to, to deal with the issue uh, the way that they see, see fit. So that's, that's what my hope is. 
And uh, we've seen a lot of growing pains in the state of Colorado over this issue. Um, our initiative is very similar to theirs. Um, we're going to have some growing pains here. We have a 92-page bill that's been introduced in the Senate. Um, if, for the people in my district, I have sent out a, a survey to better clarify what their desires are. The initiative passed um, pretty overwhelmingly in my district. Um, but I think Alaskans were just looking at uh, making sure people weren't criminalized over it. I don't know if they were looking at uh, the possibilities of the edibles, the possibilities of the manufacturing, the commercialization, and even industrialization of it. I think people are, are Alaskans overwhelmingly support the medical uses of marijuana also. So I'm actually, actually seeking my uh, information from my district to find out to better um, get in touch to see exactly what their desires are. But we have to make sure that we maintain um, public safety. We got to make sure that uh, uh, we um, um, have uh, regulations in place and statutes in place that uh, uh, the desires of the people are there, but at the same time, um, we're not uh, um, we're not uh, um, jeopardizing public safety. So from my perspective, most importantly, we need to make sure that we're protecting public safety, that we're making sure that we have ways to measure uh, intoxication for people that are operating motor vehicles and that we can protect our children. Uh, but again, as Representative Ortez said, it's a local issue. So I don't know or and, and really want to know how plants or marijuana are getting to all the communities in Alaska. Uh, but once we start production and sale operations, those operations are definitely going to be local because at least on our air, airplane system that is regulated by the FAA and our marine highway and water system that is predominantly mm -hmm. regulated by the Coast Guard, it's going to be because federal law prohibits marijuana difficult to have interstate commerce regarding marijuana. So for Juno or for my other communities, once they have production and sale operations in place, it's going to be vital to be able to try and make sure that those industries have the ability to operate. Um, one of the key items in operating is going to be how do we as a state collect taxes. Uh, my understanding is right now banks are still not accepting money from uh, marijuana commercial businesses. So if a bank cannot accept money, that means the state of Alaska has to accept cash. That means if the state of Alaska is going to be accepting cash from every location where we've got an operation, then we're going to have to have a, a revenue officer or a, a uh, uh, state employee that's av available to receive that money and then put it in our bank. So there are lots of challenges that are going to have to be overcome. Uh, parts of them will be discussed, I think, in this building. Some will be discussed by the ABC board and, and others by individual departments as they, they move forward with their regulations. And let me add, I had a lot of people step up in my district that would like to serve on a marijuana board if it ever gets, uh, gets individually uh, put together. Any other questions? Do we have anybody online by any chance? All right. Well, thank you for being part of our uh, uh, press availability this morning. Um, we're planning on working together to make sure our core values uh, um, go forward. And that's protecting public education, making our communities safer, um, making health care affordable and accessible, and uh, providing opportunities for Alaskans. So thank you for joining us.